Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I am Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? First, I'm going to roll you up into my life and talk about what I think is one of gaming's most unique soundtracks, 2004's Katamari Damashi. Following that is 2003's The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, the cell shaded adventure that stands the test of time, not only visually, but also with its lighter instrument palette on the soundtrack. Joe, couple good games this week. I want to thank all those for those who uh, listened and gave feedback on our pilot episode last week. A whole lot of fun, especially now that we're about 36 hours into Kingdom Hearts 3. Uh, it's, it's some some good times there. It's 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 a good game so far. I'm I'm definitely enjoying it. But we gotta be hush on the spoilers while we're recording. But yeah, good feedback. Uh, looking forward to talking about two more great games and their soundtracks today. Yeah, I'm especially looking forward to my first game because it is legitimately one of my favorite game soundtracks, just in general mm-hmm. of all time. I adore it, and I learned a bunch of new stuff looking it up. That is part of the fun with the research. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of Wikipedia and YouTube, and you're taking some of those sources at face value, but it's something that not a lot of people do. So when we get to pass what we learn onto you, I think that's part of the benefit. And then we've got our our five critical tracks per game, uh, and then what's on the cutting room floor, what we you know, can never forget about the game. It's It's a good discussion. I, I like the format, and I think it'll apply well to these games as well. So our first game the game that I'm bringing to the table, is Katamari Damashi, the PS2 game that came out in 2004. It is, if you've never heard of the Katamari franchise, it's weird. They're weird games. You play as the Prince of All Cosmos, who is the tiny little, I believe his canonical height is like five centimeters. He's just this tiny little dude, and his dad, the King of All Cosmos, who is the size of a planet, gets drunk one day. And breaks all of the stars. (laughs) And it is your job to roll a little ball called a Katamari around the earth, picking things up and getting bigger as you snowball and pick things up. Then they turn that into a star somehow. Don't sweat the details. That's not really what Katamari is about. It's more about just the atmosphere and the general sort of uniqueness and surrealism around it. I feel like most game enthusiasts, they know what... Katamari Damashi is. Yeah. But at least casual game fans, I think, when they at least see either the prince or the king, they're like, oh, I've I've seen that character before. Oh, this is the ball rolly game. Like I, I feel like there is at least some vague knowledge there for most people. Yeah. So Katamari Damashi is the brainchild of Keita Takahashi, who is an artist at Bandai Namco. And at that time, he sort of looked around the games industry and sort of felt like we were squandering our creative potential as an industry because everything coming out at that time was a sequel or a reboot or was based on something, some other game or based on some other property. And he just felt like we could do more. But he was just an artist. He didn't actually have any power over any of the games that Namco was making. And at one point, he got put on a game called Action Drive, which, award-winning name, (laughs) because it was supposed to be a crazy taxi clone with a spy motif, literally action and driving. Good name, guys. I don't think I've heard of that one. Uh, Well, it didn't come out. It got got canceled. So this game didn't release. (laughs) That, That would be why. And during that, he pitched a new story for the game, which was, what if? The Queen of All Cosmos got kidnapped by Earthlings, and the prince had to go save her. And the way he did that was by knocking humans out with his hammer-shaped head, jamming a steering wheel into the back of their head, and driving them like cars, (laughs) while the King of All Cosmos gives him misguided and funny humorous advice. (laughs) And of course, his, his project lead responded with, 
shut up and drive and draw the cars. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it it didn't go anywhere, and the project itself just ended up canceled completely. Yeah, he wanted to make something with those characters, and eventually the idea of Katamari sort of came to him based on the and I'm gonna need to read this name a a sport played by high schoolers in Japan on Sports Day called Tamakorogashi. I hope I said that right. Pretty close, yeah. Basically, it's just a ball. It's a game where you've got a giant ball, and you try to roll it into a goal. And he saw that and thought, huh, rolling a ball. That's interesting. And it eventually turned into making the ball bigger, picking stuff up, all that kind of thing. So he went to some of his higher-ups, some of his old bosses, colleagues and stuff, and like said, I have this idea for a game. Here's what it is. And they all said, that sounds pretty good. That sounds like it would be a fun game. But I don't know how you're going to pitch that to, like, the people who decide what projects do or don't get money. Which is the important part. You need money to make a game. What one of them suggested was to go to the Namco Hollywood Game Laboratory, which was based on a project that Konami had done before. They had set up their own school to, like, teach people how to make games where they could also, like, have students make prototypes. And those prototypes could become actual big projects that Konami would go on to publish. And Namco decided, that seems pretty good. And they did the same thing. And one of Takahashi's higher reps said, go to them, have them make you a prototype, and then you can show it off at exhibitions and stuff and maybe impress the bigwigs. They did. It was made on GameCube hardware, funnily enough, because PS2 dev kits were not great at that time. They were new. It was a new system and nobody really knew how to use them to their full potential, so they ended up making the prototype on a GameCube, which I find really, really interesting. It, interesting. it does sound like more of a Nintendo-like kind of concept of a game. Right? I've always thought that Katamari seemed like it belonged on a Nintendo system, and until Reroll, it never had been. Mm-hmm. Ever. So they made the uh, they made the prototype. It impressed the higher-ups at Bandai Namco. And they gave it a budget of 100 million yen, which in today's money would be about $800,000, which is basically nothing in, in terms of game projects. Like, that is a ridiculously small budget relative to pretty much anything else in the industry. And it took them a year and a half to make the game. Uh, they wanted to make sure the game showed four key points, which were novelty, ease of understanding, enjoyment, and humor, which I think Katamari hits all four of those pretty well. Maybe not ease of understanding. Control-wise, which is what they're talking right, about. Right, right. That, that is pretty otherwise. easy to understand, yes. When Bandai would say, like, hey, what if you added this thing to make the game more complex? Takahashi would, quote-unquote, proactively ignore them. <laughs> So that's fun. That's almost like a very corporate America sort of thing to do <laughs> and not or maybe just all around the world then, I guess. I guess. Uh, the game came out in 2004. It was sort of a success. It didn't really reach Bandai's sort of sales estimations. It sold, I want to say, like 100,000 something copies. Well, what were they expecting for the budget they put in, honestly? I believe about 500, 500,000 or it might have been 50,000. It was. It was a good amount under what they were expecting, but like the game made its money back. Oh, absolutely! But it's almost with, like with you know, that small of a budget. Yeah, but it's almost like you know, the th- more things change, the more they stay the same, kind of sort of thing. I mean, it reminds me of like the Tomb Raider stuff, yes, where it yes, made absolutely. its budget back and a and it sold a ton, but it was a financial disappointment. Right, right. It was basically that. Um, it was not released in Europe or or Australia. But the sequels would go on to be published by EA in Europe, the the next two sequels, which is hilarious. It must have been really weird because the plot of We Love Katamari, the direct sequel, is, man, it's so cool that we're famous from our cool first game, (laughs) and that's the first Katamari game Europe got. (laughs) Unfortunately... One of Takahashi's goals was to make a game that really couldn't be sequelized, that was unique enough to, like, keep it from just becoming an annualized franchise, sort of. There are now nine Katamari games. Wow. 
He has not worked on one since we love Katamari. All right, pop quiz. Try to name as many as you can. Ah, jeez. Uh, Katamari Damashi, We Love Katamari, Katamari, Beautiful Katamari, Katamari Forever, Tap My Katamari, Touch My Katamari. That's all I got. <laughs> I mean, do you count re-roll in there? Or is that just no, a remake? No, re-roll, okay. re-roll is just a remake of, of Damashi, okay. so I didn't really- Six out of really nine, pretty it. good, pretty good. The other ones are like, one's a PSP game that I didn't even know existed until looking into this, and then there's two other mobile games. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So if you're wondering why I'm I'm pretty quiet on it, it's uh I've I've seen a lot of Katamari being played. I think I maybe tried the first level. It's it's something I like I eventually want to get back to and, and play. Uh but I do have more experience with the soundtrack than the actual game itself. It's never anything I've had active involvement in really so much. Uh but but yeah, it's it's a game franchise that I certainly appreciate. It's it's nice to have a a franchise that's kind of out there, a little more creative, just a more passion project out there. And so it's, it's good to see. Mm -hmm. And he, he Takahashi would go on to leave the games industry after a little while. Once he left Bandai Namco, he made a couple of games on his own and then he left to go design children's playgrounds, but he has since come back into the industry does a lot of work with indie studios, which I think is is a good place for him. Isn't he working on uh, Watam is the game that's in the works? I believe that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. is he is currently working on a game. He made another game with an indie studio called Glitch uh, very recently. Before he left the games industry, he made another game called Nobi Nobi Boy. Yes, which yes. I've never played, but is apparently really weird. Mm-hmm. So I think the indie, I think the indie realm is a good place for Keita Takahashi. He seems like he would fit in there very well. And that's more along the lines of what he would like the industry to be in general, I think. Right. But the music though. The music. I adore this soundtrack and it was mainly spearheaded by a man named Yu Miyake, but he was not the only person that worked on it. Obviously he was the head. He was the sound design person for the entirety of the game, but other people that worked on the music were Asuka Sakai, Akitaka Toyama, Hideki Tobeta, Yoshihito Yano, and Yuri Misumi. But we're going to focus on Yumiake for the, for the purposes of this show. Mm-hmm. Yumiake was born on November 19th, 1973 in Matsuyama, Ehime Prefecture, Japan, and his mom taught people how to play Electones, which I guess is a brand name for an electric organ. Oh, interesting. I had, I had never heard of this thing, but he mentioned it multiple times in, in interviews. An electric organ makes sense. I just, yeah, never heard of Electone. Yeah. So he was raised to love music from a young age, except when he tried to take Electone lessons from his mother, he hated it. Hmm. He hated having to read from sheet music. He didn't enjoy it. He just wanted to write music. He just wanted to play music. And he's he says he is grateful for the fact that it taught him how to read sheet music in the first place, but he didn't enjoy the structured sort of thing. And then he became like a very sickly child, and he spent a lot of his time in the hospital. And that's where he started hearing a lot of like classic music and stuff, because one of the things he got in the hospital was a tape recorder or a tape player. I guess it'd be the same thing Mm -hmm. depending, but it was a tape player. And he listened to a lot of, of classical music. He listened to a lot of seventies anime music, which he specifically (laughs) pointed out as well as disco. Okay. That played a big part into his, his musical sort of repertoire. And he also played his first video games at that time, a game and watch. He was given a game and watch. Which is really funny that he brings that up as like, that was one of my first video game encounters because there's no music on a game and watch. And I don't know why that's funny to me. Yeah. But it is. Well, maybe with his creative mind, like he kind of helped, you know, fill in the blanks there in a way in his mind, his imagination. That is very possible. But he was released from the hospital after a while and was able to then go experience arcade games. And he mentions that as like, that's the first time I heard that, oh, video game music, that can be a thing. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So originally before that, he wanted to be an illustrator. But then in sixth grade, he specifically heard an album of Namco music. Like music from Namco games and decided, 
yeah, I want to work for them. And obviously he did. <laughs> he went and got a job at Namco. Man. He is self-taught when it comes to composing. He got a, a hold of a bunch of like synthesizing equipment and stuff. Just any used stuff that he could possibly get. And he just taught himself how to compose mm. music on those, on those things. And then went on to get a job composing for Namco. Wow. Which is really awesome. His discography includes, he works a lot on the Tekken franchise. He has at least participated in making the soundtrack for Tekken's 3, 4, and 5, as well as Tag Tournament 1 and 2 and Tekken Revolution. He is basically the main composer on the Ridge Racer franchise right now, or at least one of them, starting with uh, Ridge Racer 5 and onwards. He's been involved with all of them, as far as I can tell. And he even did a remix in Persona 4 Dancing All Night. He is responsible for the remix of Now I Know. Which is like a super underrated track. Like, Yeah. The ending from the Persona 4 Arena game, which is like, it's a pretty standard Persona ending track, but he he goes hard on, on the synths there. It's it's a good remix. It's very, it's a very him track. Mm, yes, yes. <laughs> One of the core ideas that he wanted to do for Katamari Damashi, first of all, he got brought on because he did music for Keita Takahashi for some animation or something. It was very unclear what it actually was. A lot of things I read said it was like an animation or like a trailer for something. I don't know what it actually mm. was, but whatever it was, it impressed Takahashi so much that when he started work on Damashi, he went to Yumiaka and said, I want you in charge of this music. Wow. So he just became the Katamari guy after that. One of the core ideas behind the music was to deny the present in his own words. Basically, he didn't want to do anything that other play other people were doing huge amounts of he wanted this soundtrack to be unique he wanted it to be different and i'd say he succeeded uh, yeah and it's one of the reasons why almost all of the songs were involve vocals in some way whether they be synthesized vocals or like real recorded vocals because a lot of games weren't doing that back in 2004 especially the whole soundtrack being that in 2004 mm -hmm. a lot of games still don't do that no, uh, yeah, it's usually just like what well, it's a title theme. It's placed at at certain times, but yeah, I think a lot of composers today would think it's it's overkill. But it it's really just the range of styles that really makes it pass for at least this first soundtrack. Yeah, and obviously Miyake and Takahashi got along extremely well because they both sort of had that idea of I don't want to do something that other people are already doing. I want sure. it to be fresh. I want it to be new, and. Miyake also sort of had the feeling, and I don't really agree with this outlook, that music for games during this era and back in the 90s was, as he says, good for its purpose, but largely forgettable outside the context of the game. Hmm. I disagree with that, but I can also sort of see where he's coming from, and I could get why he would believe that. But again, like, I don't agree. We're doing a show about video game music. <laughs> 90s games are going to come up. There right. are great soundtracks out of that era. I think in a sense, maybe where he's coming from, like especially the early 90s, when you're talking about the SNES chip, when you're talking about the Genesis sound chip, yeah. the soundtracks start to blur together a little bit. You only have so many instruments to work with. Of course, as we talked about on, on the last episode, this is where the best composers really bring their melodies forward. And that's what carries uh, those songs at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think that's maybe where he has a point is that a lot of them can blur together because you are limited on a technology front. Uh, but yeah, when you're going into the early 2000s, you definitely have a broader range for sure. And just one final thing to just give you an idea of how eccentric Miyake really is. This is a direct quote that I, I am a big fan of 
in regards to when he was recording vocalists just for Katamari games in general. In my performing philosophy, the first time is often the charm. It's fascinating to record performers when they don't understand the material. (laughs) So... That's weird. That's a yeah. weird way to go about it. <laughs> it's kind of backwards from a lot of uh, creative work uh, these days. But, you know, I, he does have a point that, like, there is a certain, yeah, there is a charm. There's a naturalness to it. And if the performer is talented enough, you know, they'll have a really strong performance on, on the first go, at least. Yeah. And sometimes some magical stuff can come out of performing a song for the first time. And that might even be what you want to use. I was taught always when recording vocals, God, do multiple takes. Oh, yeah. It's oh, yeah. Required. Always. Always. And, you know, podcasts, like, we'll stitch together and we'll edit and all that. But, I mean, for us, it's like, that's a that's a first go. Like, there's yeah. something natural there. Um, but, yeah, when we get to talking about, like, he's working with child vocalists. And it's like, you're not going to have the patience to tell them, all right, can we do take 10 on that? <laughs> like, the- And they're not going to have the patience to, to sit down for it yeah, either. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to some five critical tracks. Cause I'm, I'm itching to talk about the songs and you gotta start when talking about the Katamari soundtrack with the main theme of the game, Katamari on the rocks. Of course you do. So this is the intro song to the game. It's also the main theme of the game. It's the one everybody knows. Oh, and yeah. You don't have to play Katamari. You just, it's like you don't you hear the title Katamari on the rocks. You're just like, I, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's the na 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 yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. So like fun fact on that na 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 na. One of the things with that part was Miyake would say that part of his creative sort of process was if he was just walking down the street or walking around his home or something and suddenly he had an idea for a melody he would grab a recorder Mm -hmm. and just hum it into his recorder and that's where that sort of na 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 part came from and even (laughs) in the beginning of the game during the sort of tutorial there's even a guy just sort of quietly na na Yes, yes, that's right. Yep. And that's that's where that came from. That's not Miyake, unfortunately. When I read oh, that, I was like, oh, man. is that him? <laughs> That'd but be really not. cool. <laughs> they, they got a different dude to record it, which is unfortunate, but uh, understandable. And, and it's more, you know, vocal affectations, too. I mean, it's the choo 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 do choo 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 do like little things like that, too. It, it makes it stand out. It also just, like, immediately you know what kind of game you're playing. The first words spoken in the entire song are don't worry do your best mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perfect so the lyrics of the song were actually written by miyake and takahashi this is the only song that keita takahashi was involved in mm. which is very weird that you don't often see that you don't often see like the director of the game wrote one of the songs Cough, cough, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Masahiro Sakurai. <laughs> Pretty much. That's like the only place I can think yeah, of yeah. where that, that's happened before. And that's really interesting to me. And I think that probably shows why the lyrics are so more simple. Mm-hmm. So much more simple than, than any of the other songs. Well, I mean, it's the hands-on passion project. I mean, it shows the investment and how much the creator cares for sure. He wanted to be involved with the main theme of the game. Yeah. And that's totally understandable. The vocals were sung by Masayuki Tanaka and Tomomi Suzuki. Miyake said that he wanted a song that immediately would remind you of the game you are you were playing. If you heard it anywhere else, it would make you want to go play it again once you heard it. And wow, he succeeded. Yeah, mission goddamn that. accomplished. <laughs> you can't 
associate this song with anything other than Katamari, regardless of what game it is, because every single Katamari game has involved this song in some form. So, he did it. Our next song is called Lonely Rolling Star. And I actually learned a story about this song while looking into it. Do tell. This is, this is one of the first songs you hear in the game in an actual level. The lyrics were written by Yoshihito Yano and sung by a Japanese pop artist named Saki Kabata. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due. I know about this story because the YouTube channel Wooly Verses is doing a Katamari re-roll LP right now. And one of the things that he wanted to do with that was he brought somebody on to kind of do what we're doing, to research the game and have Mm. talking points ready for when they got to certain parts. So got to give credit to him. Go check him out. He's got a fantastic channel. Wonderful dude. It is generally believed that the lyrics for all of the music was written before any of the artists were picked to sing them. And it is also generally believed that the lyrics would have been recorded by Miss Kabata before this story would have taken place. But a couple months prior to Katamari Damashi being released, Miss Kabata's best friend was killed in a car accident. Mm. And again, it is generally assumed that the lyrics would, the vocals would have been recorded before this and the lyrics would have been written before this. But when looking at the lyrics through that lens of this is the only thing that was released by this lady for six months because she was grieving the death of her best friend gives this song an entirely new context. And if, if I may read just a couple lines of the lyrics, just to sort of drive that point home, but you are painting an important dream until you're done. I'll be waiting here always. Shall we meet again next month at that place? Your lonely rolling star, don't stand in one place, okay? Your lonely rolling star, remember me, okay? Your lonely rolling star, I can't wait for you, okay? Your lonely rolling star, so face forward and let's go. Jesus. And that just has an entirely new context when you look at it through that lens. Yep. And I had no idea that this story existed before last week when I started doing this research. Mm. Nobody knows if that tragedy actually affected the performance and the song at all or affected the lyrics or anything. It's generally considered that it didn't and that it's just a coincidence, but it is certainly a very, very sad and interesting story that is attached to this song now Mm. in my heart. Wow. But I'm never, I'm never going to look at this song the same way again. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and considering the actual song itself, like it's a very happy, upbeat song. It's, it's supposed to kind of get you kind of learning the basics of the game. In my notes, I have it down as, an, as just a happy, carefree song that almost feels encouraging in a way. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting to play from a, an English perspective. Yeah, it's Japanese lyrics, but... Unless you speak it, you have no idea what it's it's saying. It's just, oh, it's it's happy and it's it has those lyrics. And overall, just the whole song, I believe the idea is it's supposed to be written from the perspective of somebody who is in love with somebody, but that person has their own stuff to do and they have to go their separate ways. Sure, sure. But one day maybe they'll come back together. Yeah. And it could be very easy knowing that story to look back and think, oh, it's being sung from the perspective of the friend. Mm -hmm. The friend is telling her, keep going. I know it's, I know it's sad, but you gotta, you gotta keep moving forward. Yeah. It's an extremely interesting story. Wow. Thank you for sharing. 
The next one I don't have a cool story for. It's just my favorite song in the game, and I think it's one of the more unique tracks in the game. Gin and Tonic and Red Red Roses, also known as a Crimson Rose and a Gin Tonic. Man, this one's good. This song is so good. Uh, just try not to tap your foot to this song. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> you can't do it. It's it's Japanese scat jazz, which is not a genre that you ever hear. It is the most memorable song in the game, I think, outside of On the Rocks. Sure, sure. I, I'd agree with that. Just, it's, it's so upbeat, and it makes the level you're playing so fun. And again, I don't have a story to tell about this one unfortunately the lyrics were written by asuka sakai vocals were by ado mizumori and asami shimada it's just a good song i don't know where else to go from there it reminds me a lot of the gravity rush soundtrack in a way yeah this kind of i can see that piano jazz uh, sort of thing now it doesn't have the uh, the scat vocals to go with it but uh mm -hmm. whenever i i hear this song i immediately think of that soundtrack in particular uh, especially the one with like the pleasure quarter section of the game uh, it's very very similar in that sense uh but yeah it's a super super good song for sure this is one of those songs that i would love to see performed live and maybe one day i will i don't know and it's another one where like the vocals have quite the range of moods to it uh you know there's there's definitely like kind of like the soulful jazz especially with the ba 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 in the chorus but then there's like the playfulness when it's like almost like the puckering of the the mouth in a way like to <laughs> the ooh, ooh. yeah some of those ones uh yeah it, <laughs> in a way that kind of reminds me of like cheeky anime acting in a way uh like especially when when they do that sort of thing uh it's i don't know that's just kind of what i think of when i think of the vocals like, in particular. i get exactly where you're coming mm -hmm. from yeah next we've got a song entirely in english which is also super weird for a japanese made game back in 2004 k sera sera <laughs> It's almost like a Frank Sinatra song. That's a very good way of describing it, yeah. Like, and it's in full English, which is weird. And it's not, as far as I can tell, was not sung by, like, they didn't bring an American in to perform it. Well, his first name is Charles. <laughs> his first name is Charles, but I don't think... I believe that's a stage name. Maybe. He's a, he's a lounge singer, from what I gathered. I, I did a little bit of research on this guy, but all I could really find was he's a lounge singer and he is Japanese. Uh, lyrics were written by Asuka Sakai again and Natsuki Isakai. Or Isaki? Isaki. There we go. And the vocals were done by Charles Kose. He's a lounge singer. That's all I could really find. He's not a big figure so it's difficult to find information on some of these people yeah yeah you still hear the accent on it for sure but uh and it's, it's a good job it's a good performance yeah but like when he says wool like when he says the word roll he's saying i want to wool you up into my life and it's <laughs> you can hear it you can hear it there yeah. but otherwise it's really impressively done and if you told me that it was an american dude i'd believe you sure and again, it's just really impressive that even now, game soundtracks tend to not bring in English speakers to perform songs in English. And, he, and when they do, they're like, no offense, broken English, sort of. Yeah, like, I mean. Think, think of the Persona soundtracks. Yes, yes, absolutely. Where those are, those are in English. A lot of those are in complete English, but they don't make sense. 
Like a lot of the songs of Persona 3 make zero sense if you look at the lyrics. Sometimes, yes and no. Yeah, when you look at the lyrics, like maybe they make some sense, but it's Mm -hmm. it's just not what you hear. You hear like something totally different. And yet this sounds like a guy performing in an old club. Yeah, definitely. In English. And lastly, we've got Cherry Tree Times, a.k.a. Cherry Blossom Color Season. Funnily enough, Miyake claims that this is his favorite song in the entire franchise. Interesting. I, I can see that because uh, it has a very uh, sort of unique style to it with the children's choir. Uh, it kind of goes back to his ideas you mentioned before of just that purity of probably the first performance because they're kids. Like, mm-hmm. uh, what are they going to do? And you can hear like the, the performances and the verses are pretty darn raw. Yeah, he he describes it as a mock Japanese folk song couched in formal language with horribly stereotypical lyrics about lost love, but sung by a children's chorus, which, yeah, that's the song. (laughs) That's it. Yeah, yeah, all right. (laughs) Uh, He he describes it to a T. It's really relaxing, and actually, like, listening to it has the ability to sort of make me a little bit emotional, which is really Mm -hmm. weird. To say about this surrealist, goofy ball rolling game, but it does. I get it though. Like again, if you don't know the lyrics, like it, there's a purity to it. Like everything is good and fine in the world, pretty much. And it's when in reality, in the Katamari world, that's not the case. Oh uh, well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the the cosmos is collapsing. Please piece it back together. <laughs> This song is very regularly put up against a a backdrop of people screaming as you pick them up in the Katamari. <laughs> I so, see. There almost needs to be like a, a meme sort of thing going with it. I almost saw you like terrible events with this as background music. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would make that. I should make that. That's a good idea. <laughs> but it's it's just. It's a gorgeous piece. Miyake, I believe, sort of said that it was an experiment on his part to see if he could make a really good song out of just more simple chords, and I, I he succeeded. It's a very, very, very good song. It's a lot of people's mm. favorite song in the franchise, just like Miyake. It's my roommate Ben's favorite song in Katamari Damashi, and he got really happy when I told him that Miyake agreed with him. It's just really good. I wish I could find more about the children that sang it, but there is no information, obviously, because they're kids. They were probably developer kids, for all I know. Yeah, maybe that would probably have uh, saved a buck or two. Probably. They didn't have a lot of money. (laughs) When it comes to tracks on the cutting room floor, uh, honestly, like when I think of the Katamari Damashi soundtrack, I think of these five songs. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's more just... My lack of experience with the game, I guess, but uh, just, you know, from knowing your interests and from hearing the soundtrack and just kind of getting a gist of it. Like, yeah, these are the standouts for sure. Uh, one of your your second one here that you have in this outline for your, your cutting room floor here. I've also heard that one, but I, I think I think you've ranked it appropriately. I think it's a good list. It was like picking my own, like picking which children I was going to put on the pedestal. I Mm -hmm. adore every song on this soundtrack. They're all extremely good. As for on the cutting room floor, I actually have three, one that I didn't mark on here. One is uh, Walking on a Star, which is the menu and sort of level select music. It's just a nice little relaxing song. Very, very simple. Fun thing. Uh, The Moon and the Prince.
which is just a weird sort of, I would describe it as glitchy rap almost. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's very difficult for me to like put it into one genre, but it's also a very good song. And then the song You Are Smart. which is just a really weird sort of electronic song that involves a text-to-speech voice saying the words, You Are Smart, that would later get rolled into my one of my favorite songs ever, just no matter what, outside of video game soundtracks, everything. It's one of my favorite songs, but that's a topic for another day. So, Joe, what will you never forget about Katamari Damashi? Just the way it makes me feel. It's impossible mm-hmm. to be in a bad mood while playing Katamari. It, it, you can't do it. It's one of those games that I can pick up and I can beat in three hours and I'm happy again and I'm having a good time and it's just charming. It feels warm. When I played Reroll, when I picked it up, which by the way, please buy Katamari Damashi Reroll, everybody watching. They released it the same day as Super Smash Brothers. That game was sent out to die. Please give it money. <laughs> I want to see more of these on Switch. Yeah, I've got a few uh, few games in my backlog right now. Or we're thinking, you know, Kingdom Hearts three, of course. I've got Shadow of the Tomb Raider as a rental, Resident Evil two. I bought, but I think that one's probably next on the list if we're going to hit a down period here. It's a good choice, and like, it was my first game that I played to start out the year of 2019. I didn't mean to play it all the way through, but I sort of sat down and said, "I'm going to stop when I fail a level," and then proceeded to not fail a single level. <laughs> <laughs> All the way up until the end. It's a fantastic game. It is just a happy, feel-good, stress-relieving game, and I absolutely recommend it to anybody looking for something like that. For the transitions and the ending, we, we try to highlight a fan cover or a fan sort of remix or something like that. I was, coincidentally enough, turned on to this channel while I was researching the game by my roommate Ben. It is by a YouTube channel called The 8-Bit Big Band. Super impressive channel. It's it's pretty amazing, actually. I had I had never heard of them until last week. I have now watched all of their videos. I'm subscribed. I'm super in. Fantastic channel. They performed a version of Lonely Rolling Star, which is extremely good and also a very cute video. I don't have as much research for my game because it is it's not readily available. That sounds like Nintendo. Which, you know, it is, it is par for the course for Nintendo. We're talking Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Um, obviously, it's, it's one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, I'd put it in the top five. Probably it's, it's number three right now, the, the HD version. It's my second favorite Zelda, uh, right okay. behind Majora's Mask for me. When it comes to how The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker has been critically and sort of fan received in a way, uh, back when it was made, I think we kind of all have to start with the infamous 2000 Space World demo. Now, Nintendo Space World was a sort of Nintendo sort of conference setting. It was usually like in August at the time where they'd show Nintendo things. It's almost like an E3 kind of deal for them recently to give people an idea we just got like stuff from one of the pokemon gen 2 space world demos like Mm -hmm. that leaked and it was completely different yeah but they they showed off stuff like that so it was a long time ago i mean gosh 19 years ago all the way back in 2000 uh and it showed the kind of more realistic looking perspective zelda game for the upcoming gamecube and it's link fighting ganondorf and it's what all those fans would have wanted Except game director Eiji Aonuma hated it, which I did not know. Uh, He found it derivative of past Zelda games, and he and the team wanted to do something different. 
So fast forward one year later to the 2001 Space World demo, and they show a cell shaded younger looking Link for the first time with the Moblins from the game. And there's some combat and you see some of the Moblin panic animations and the, the two Links being chased by, you know, several Moblins. And it's like, it's very basic stuff, but it's, it's definitely in that what would become the Wind Waker style. And uh, there were some at the show who enjoyed it, certainly, and but some who were a little uncertain. And online, as those of us who are old enough remember, there was the CELDA, the C-E-L-D-A backlash. See, I've never heard that name. That's such a good name. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it, it is. But like that, that was definitely a thing at the time. And people did not like it. Uh, Shigeru Miyamoto was surprised by this negative feedback. And so he said, all right, we're going to limit showing uh, this game until the gameplay can be the focus. So what happens during E3 2002? So not even a full year later, they show a gameplay demo. And, you know, people were actually pretty positive on the gameplay. It's like, all right, this is Zelda. It looks different, but we can tell that this is, is Zelda. Uh, and they must have been playing on the Forsaken Fortress uh, level because the... Uh, mechanic of trying to steal the enemy's weapons was being shown off, but it was glitching apparently. And so it kind of gave me memories of a uh, skyward sword and an yeah, E3. I was, I was about to say that sounds like a very Zelda show off thing. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, uh, that was apparently a little weird and didn't go perfectly according to plan, but a lot of people looked at the gameplay and like, you know what? This is a Zelda game through and through at the end of the day. And this is still several months before, the actual title of the game is known. It must have been just, you know, Legend of Zelda for Nintendo GameCube. Uh, so eventually in Japan, it got the subtitle of Kaze no Takuto, uh, which is uh, Baton of the Wind, essentially, or the Wind Baton, uh, which it makes sense that it then gets translated to The Wind Waker, which is the English title of that baton. Uh a lot of people know the story of how there were two dungeons that were planned for later in the game. You know, after you have the kind of halfway break, it would make sense to have something like four dungeons. Uh, but they cut two of them because they were kind of running out of time for when they wanted to release the game. And instead, uh, had it in favor of the Triforce quest, the, the Triforce Shard quest, which, you know, a lot of people kind of bag on it and it's it's not their favorite. Uh, but I guess I, I found out through this research that in the time between the late 2002, early 2003 sort of time period between Japanese and American release, the development team kind of patched up and like shortened the uh, the Triforce Shard quest a little bit. Hmm. So you think it was bad, you know, maybe you try uh, the Japanese version, see see how that, uh, you know, how that works for you. I also didn't know that. Interesting. I mean, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably got a lot of feedback from Japanese players being like, this is too long. We yeah. Thought, well, we have a chance to fix it. And in an age of, you know, where patches weren't a thing, right? And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe some listeners being like, that was a thing. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, but of course, a lot of people say that, you know, kind of dungeon elements for those two cut dungeons uh, were used and sprinkled throughout Zelda games since. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Whenever when someone says like, oh, why didn't they bring the two dungeons back in the HD version? It's just like... They weren't, they weren't done. They weren't done. Like that's, that's not the point of it. And uh, honestly, the HD version like makes that uh, shard quest way, way, way better. So uh, once the game comes out, mass critical acclaim. Uh, you look at the Metacritic... For this game now, the original Wind Waker, it's a 96 with 80 critics. Like, that's pretty damn impressive. I uh, also didn't know that a Wind Waker 2, as a result of this, was planned as a direct sequel for the GameCube. But uh, sales were lower in North America, probably because of the whole Zelda thing. Uh, and they kind of wanted that more mature sort of looking Zelda game. And then the Japanese game market was kind of in a downturn. So the team kind of thought, well, we kind of need to appeal to the West because that's where the stronger part of the industry is right now. And they didn't like the cell shaded look. 
Uh, this is where Aonuma goes to Miyamoto and convinces him, hey, we need to have this realistic style for what would become Twilight Princess. Uh, which still made the GameCube, but it also made Wii as well. Of course, Toon Link, the character, would go on and star in other games, not only the uh, you know Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks sequels, in a way, spiritual sequels on uh, on DS, but I mean, you see him in, in Super Smash Brothers, and so I, the lineage sort of lives on. I mean, there, there's Minish Cap e- even. So the Four Swords, he became yeah, Four Swords. Yeah, thing. absolutely. Uh, so Toon Link wasn't just a one and done thing with Wind Waker. Like that sort of lineage continued. And then, of course, you have uh, Wind Waker HD in 2013, which uh, before Joker was revealed for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate was, I would say, like the video game announcement that like just broke me the most as far as like this is everything I wanted. I remember listening to the show that was recorded after you learned about it. You were pretty hyped. Yeah, I remember that. I I remember watching it at work, and it's one of those like all the blood drains from the head <laughs> kind of thing because like you can't exclaim and be vocal about it, but it's just like oh my god, like this this really happening? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But the the soundtrack in particular for Wind Waker, I mean, Zelda games are games where they can be replayed a whole lot, and that's kind of why I love Wind Waker because it feels like the most approachable. In that sense, maybe you put Ocarina up there. But for me, I, I love always going back to Wind Waker uh, as far as for the gameplay. But the soundtrack is one of the most unique in the whole series. Uh, and so it's it's responsible for a four-person team with Kenta Nagata, Hajime Wakai, uh, Toru Minigishi, and Koji Kondo, uh, the, the legendary Koji Kondo. Uh Koji Kondo, who didn't compose as many of the tracks, I mean, a lot of the original tracks that were continued into Wind Waker were, of course, uh, his doing. But he was kind of more just a supervisor uh, uh, mm-hmm. as a whole. Uh, Hajime Wakai, kind of more known for, he kind of took the helm on Skyward Sword in the Zelda franchise, and Toru Minigishi, uh, known for Twilight Princess. But here's Kenta Nagata, who is kind of the head of this uh, project. He composed most of the songs. Um, So his background info, he was born in 1970, of course, in Japan. Had been with Nintendo since 1996. Uh, He's proficient in playing piano and bass. Also plays the guitar. An interesting bit in the different fan wikis that I was was seeing (laughs) said that fans speculate that he is married to... Shinobu Nagata, who is also a Nintendo <laughs> composer. Uh, she's mostly well known for composing the Animal Crossing New Leaf soundtrack. Uh, the two of them worked together on the Mario Kart Double Dash soundtrack. I don't even know what the credits were at the time. Maybe that's how they met. I don't know. So it actually says in the wikis that maybe they're married at, when they met at Nintendo, but this is not <laughs> confirmed. <laughs> And it's like it's like the kind of stuff you hear with like pop artists. I know uh, it's it's really interesting. I, I could I could see that being a story, but there's just there's no way to confirm it apparently in these fan communities. So that's beautiful. I I just found that very interesting. Uh, Kenta Nagata's discography, as far as when it comes to games, he's not like Bear McCreary where he's gone all for you know TV, movies, and games. He's you know been. With Nintendo for a long time. And what a banger of a first game to have your main composing credit be on Mario Kart 64. <laughs> that's a pretty good start, honestly. That's your uh that's your first composing credit in the game industry. Like, god damn, that's it's a very, very good one. He's also composed for 1080 snowboarding, Pokemon Stadium, as mentioned, Mario Kart Double Dash, Big Brain Academy, Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass, Wii Music and Mario Kart 7. Uh, Since then, kind of in the later years here, he's kind of taken more of a director-supervisor role. So the different Super Smash Bros. games since Brawl, New Super Mario Bros. Wii, and New Super Mario Bros. 2, Mario Kart 8, and even Super Mario Run on uh, the mobile devices there. So a a good history of Nintendo games, you know, big into uh, Mario Kart music, which is always stellar but i think wind waker is a really special one here because they always say that the soundtrack was inspired by traditional 
Irish music, which, you know, for like an islands and, and the sea, I, I suppose it kind of makes sense. It ma- it makes sense because like it feels like the sort of music like when you're watching an animated film about sailors mm. and there's the scene where they're all dancing on the deck. This is the like the Wind Waker feels like the same sort of music that would be playing in that yeah scene almost, mm-hmm. and a lot of that's like Celtic sort of stuff. Sure, yeah that that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's just you know a lighter instrument palette. It's a lot more upbeat than some of the the previous soundtracks. Uh, at the point here in in 2003, where the MIDI technology has improved, uh, the instruments sound at least closer to their original real recording counterparts, except horns. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You can still tell that there's uh, definitely MIDI work going on, and especially for timing, uh, you know, especially in in battles where it's that kind of dynamic battle music. Uh, Definitely needs to be MIDI, but I think you know, like Twilight Princess was the first one where like it's it, it's a tough you know to tell between the two. Uh, this is still in the age of MIDI, and you can tell. Uh, and it's the first time in the Zelda franchise that wordless vocals were recorded. Uh, they are specifically referencing the music when you're conducting the Wind Waker, and may note that it was in the key of D major, which is like, huh? Yeah, I. I guess I had never thought about it, but that that makes sense. Also, hmm. on the title theme, uh, it is reportedly Shigeru Miyamoto playing the mandolin <laughs> with, with, with those simple little chords. And it's like, you know, get, get Shigeru in there. That, that makes sense. I can see him doing it in my head. Mm-hmm. That's, oh, that's so great. So speaking of that title theme, when we talk about five critical tracks. I'm actually going to pick the ending theme, which is, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's the same melodies and all used in the title theme. But we're mm. going to go with the first one here, Staff Credits. <laughs> it's probably, at least in the top 10, if not one of the best ending themes in games of all time. Like, it's it's up there. I think it might be up there as like one of my favorite Zelda songs, just in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, it's, it's gorgeous. It is a combining of different character themes and, and tracks throughout the game in that sort of a, a finality sort of way. Uh, and you're getting a whole lot of different instruments. I mean, we're talking flute, the fiddle, that that Shigeru mandolin. Uh, you get some good French horn in there. And of course, when the deep strings kind of cut in uh, with the bass and the cello, uh, that's that's really kind of where the full sound comes in. It really, really sounds excellent. Uh, the primary themes used, uh, of course, if you're familiar with the game, uh, it's the Earth's God's Lyric. It's the Wind God's Aria, there's Errol's theme, and then, of course, just a little sprinkling of Zelda's lullaby in there. Um, but it's one of those ones where, like, yeah, you hear the title theme, and, and those two, you know, the Earth God and Wind God, uh, and you hear the melody, and then it's you're playing the game, and, and those are, like, the last two dungeons before the Ganon's Tower sort of thing. But, like, you get to uh, the point where you're recruiting the sages of Medley and Makar, and and they're playing this melody. And I'm like, oh, that's what it is. Like, that's what I'm hearing when I'm booting up the game every time. Uh, it's just a special, special piece of music. As somebody that was in orchestra in high, all the way through high school, uh, I wish I had played Wind Waker before graduating mm. high school. Because mm. this is one of those songs I wish I would have been able to, like, bang out by ear yeah. on a violin. The fiddle part is so good. It's so good. It, it's fantastic and yeah you can see sort of the the irish roots in a way sort of inspired there for sure uh it's just a really really special track one of the best endings ever and yeah you know wind waker is one of those ones where you will play the uh the youtube video and just go down in the comments and everyone's just like this is the best mm. i love this <laughs> wind waker yes and it's just like 
it's good to kind of see some positivity there in, in the community. Uh, second of the five critical tracks, we're talking ocean. Yeah. Adventure. Adventure is the name of the game. You could call it the Great Sea, uh, you know, translations, what have you. Uh, but this is like the definitive song of adventure. And it's where people say, I don't know, I kind of get sick of the sailing in Wind Waker. Like, do you have your TV muted? Because I don't know how that happens with this song going. Yeah, I also never got that because when I before I played Wind Waker, people were like, yeah, the sailing just sort of gets old. It gets really boring. And I never had that that problem. And the music's a big part of that. It's just it's it's adventure. I don't know how else to describe <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, the brass is definitely the standout here with uh, it, its soaring melodies. But uh, a special shout out to the snare drum kind of keeping that pace and like you're moving forward like this. This track's going places we're not you know lagging behind like the the snare is just it's always moving always going so uh that that's sort of a special one but yeah i mean you said it like it's it's adventure it's all you gotta say it's and you know when we're out in the real world and we're on you know a big adventure of our own like it's hard to not think of this song honestly mm -hmm. i still think about it when i'm like driving somewhere every once in a while it'll pop into my head or like any game that requires sailing in any way, shape, or form. I'll be playing Minecraft and get in a boat and start sailing somewhere, and this is the song that comes in my head. Oh my god, I need to play any Assassin's Creed that has it, whether it's Black Flag Odyssey. <laughs> right? Just get this song going instead. Like that, that'd be fantastic. Oh my goodness! Wow, yeah, no, it's a it's a really solid solid track. Number three, Dragon Roost Island. I absolutely adore this song with all my heart. It's a really, really special track because you have those first couple islands with Outset Island, with Windfall Island, and they have you know that definitely lighter, bouncy sort of uh, style to them. But they're also islands where they're predominantly filled with human characters. And then you get to Dragon Roost, and it's it's the Rito, it's it's the bird people. And you met one of them, your postman that you met on an Outside Island, so you're familiar with the Rito. Uh, but this is a whole culture of them. And it's that fast strumming mandolin that's just a crazy, impressive strumming technique and rhythm. Uh, you, you try to emulate it like it takes real skill to do. Of course, the the flute melody. Uh, and they got, when they bring it back... Uh, at the end of sort of that main quest and Kamali is just soaring out there with his wings. Uh, and it's, it's that sad sort of reprise, uh, man, like with the lower flute med uh, melody, uh, that's, that's a special one just to kind of call it back. But yeah, it, it, the bass comes in with that walking line, uh, put headphones on for that one because man it's it's a really really good track i i'm a sucker for like acoustic sort of chords like that and so this song severely like it resonates with me a lot and it's one of those songs where i know like it's a mandolin and not a, a not a guitar but like i wish i knew how to play guitar <laughs> so i could learn how to play this song yeah which would not be easy like you said it's it's a hard rhythm to sort of keep up with but I want that. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, the ba 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 ba. Yeah, and like the the use of triplets in there is is also really it's a neat little thing that not every song does. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those songs where like you hear it, I mean, 
all of these are like that's that's Wind Waker, but this one I feel like it's maybe more than the others. It's tough to say, but like that's it's like a definitely Wind Waker kind of song, much like the number four track Mulgara. I was about to start doing that, too. (laughs) Uh, Mulgara is not the best boss battle in the game, but it's the most memorable boss battle track. It's the only boss theme that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, uh, it's it's one of those special ones. I don't even remember what Mulgara looks like, but I remember the song. Yeah, he's the big old sandworm that in Breath of the Wild they kind of brought back a little bit with Mulduga. Uh, Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, big sandworm, hookshot, the the eye that's in his mouth or whatever, slash away at it. Uh, it kind of develops where you got the enemies popping out. So even like later in the track, and if, if I did my editing correctly, I'm, I'm playing this part uh, for the sample. But they add these syncopated offbeat accents, which like just really helps the tension of the battle because... It's a song that's all about layers, and we're just adding more and more to it. It you know, starts with the chicka chicka chickas, and then we're adding the gongs, we're adding the flute, then the the kind of underlying bass chords, and yeah, it's these bah, like sort of just hit on the offbeat sort of a uh, sort of accents there. Just really helps the the just impact and tension later in the battle. Uh, so. That's it's a good one. It's another one where like yeah, people think Wind Waker like this is one you got to mention as far as the range and diversity of what's offered on the soundtrack. It's also a really fun song to whistle. Oh man, if you can, by all means. <laughs> I can. I cannot. <laughs> so, but I like I wish I could and that'd be one that's yeah, it gets it gets stuck in your head. Like that's that's a pretty simple but intense flute melody. So, uh, I'll I'll definitely give it that. And then the five, number five out of five critical tracks, Farewell Hyrule King. had to put this one on there uh just a very intense but depressing and heartbreaking piano piece and it's just it's flawless in its execution uh this is one where koji kondo the original master behind it it's the hyrule castle theme from link to the past um and it has a bit of the uh original dungeon theme from the original legend of zelda in there uh but man it's point in the story and again it's it's a years old game by this point spoilers should not be an issue for you almost 20 but it's it's the death of the king of hyrule where he gives himself up to let uh link and zelda go free and then after that point your boat is silent (laughs) because you know he's kind of lost that spirit uh but just a, a just a gripping but terribly sad piano piece uh, where he's just kind of talking about how he's failed, but he needs to give the future a, a choice, a, 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 some hope, honestly. Uh, but I know, Joe, you love piano pieces, and it's not just I put it in for you. Like This is, <laughs> this is a song that you have to talk about when you're talking about Wind Waker's soundtrack. This this song is what we'd call Joe Bait. No, it wasn't. This this was a good choice to put on there, a hundred percent. It is a fantastic piece. It's gorgeous. Wind Waker has my favorite ending mm. of any of the Zelda sure, games. Sure, because uh, I think it it has the best sort of characterization for Ganondorf that happens at the end there. The 
the King of Hyrule's stuff is is really interesting. The final boss is fun. He gets stabbed in the forehead. <laughs> it's a very, very strong sort of end game and end sequence. And this song absolutely adds to that. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it just brings it all home for sure. Tracks that were on the cutting room floor, for me, another boss battle that at first I was thinking maybe Godon, but as far as when it comes to a track, I think Phantom Ganon has to be mentioned. It's another one that's just that, that weird sort of rhythm to it. Uh, you can talk about like you know the final boss battle with Ganon, but like that's kind of a more classic Ganon boss battle. This one's a little mm -hmm. weird in the sense where like it even comes uh, Phantom Ganon referenced and used in Hyrule Warriors. So it's like they pull a boss from that game and they use Phantom Ganon. Like that's it's a pretty important one. And then to start off the whole game, it's uh, just a brilliant deconstruction and use of different instruments for the main Zelda theme, the legendary hero. You know, a lot of people remember because it's it's the first thing you hear in this game and it's telling the hero's story of what, you know, what this Link has to kind of live up to in a way. But when it comes to flutes and harpsichords and everything and, and then the violin comes in, it's, yeah, that's, that's the Zelda lineage. As for me, if I had to pick a couple of songs to put on this list, though, I think your five are a pretty good spread and honestly the best five you could have picked but i am a big fan of outset island sure i just like the sort of bounciness like you, you described them earlier my other one as well is windfall island And you described both of these earlier as just they're bouncy, they are carefree, they're sort of happy, and I just like that. It it resonates with me. I'm a big fan. They set the stage very well because you have to get the player invested in the world and believing in the world so that they can continue on to something like Dragon Roost and all the other islands still to go. But they're two very good islands that kind of set the basic parameters on what we're kind of looking at here with this world. I, I, they're They're strong choices for sure. So I will never forget just the sense of adventure in Wind Waker. As we kind of mentioned before, like people bag on the sailing, but there's a sense of freedom to it. And they try to recapture it in Skyward Sword where you're flying on your Skyloft and it's not the same yeah. using your Wii remote to, to flap and all that. Like, no, it's, it's a lot more obvious that you're you're just sort of... I don't want to say on rails in Skyward Sword, but it's you don't have a lot of places you can actually go. Mm -hmm. And in Wind Waker, it's the ocean. You can go wherever you want. Yeah. And, and you find little fishmen and throw bait and they go, okay, and they give you, give you the map. <laughs> and that's really the most important aspect of Wind Waker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Wind Waker does have its, its weaker moments. I mean, would I start the game with stealth on, you know, uh, Forbidden Fortress? No. Would I yeah. do the, you know... The Triforce quest, as it were, in the original? No. Uh, but that's where you, you should try to play HD. And I hope it eventually comes to Switch and it's not just blocked on Wii U forever. I'll, I'll buy it again. I'll buy it again, Nintendo. You heard me. Oh, yeah. And, and put Twilight Princess on there while you're at it. Just just all, all the Zelda games. I, I know you got the rumors of Skyward Sword floating around, but more than just that, please. <laughs> I love Skyward Sword, but I can tell you very much that the people that want that game on the Switch are a far smaller group than the people that want Wind Waker or Twilight Princess. Absolutely. I love Skyward Sword, don't get me wrong, but I'm in a minority as far as I can tell. 
Mm-hmm. And I believe you're you're in that minority as well. You like Skyward Sword, don't you? I do. I do. Yeah. It's not as bad of a game as people often say. And I played it uh, within the last year or two and really liked it again. So yeah, it's 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 a fun one. So that'll do it for original sound chat. Our, our second episode, good pair of games for sure. Uh, you can find the MP3 versions on anondino.squarespace.com. Uh, we're hoping to get the podcast feeds up on iTunes, on Google Play. We'll see if Spotify is a thing, because that is the trend for podcasts these days, if it's possible, because it all depends on where the podcasts are hosts and weird things like that. But we'd like to have at least a couple established before we put the feed up there. So we'll get that soon. Mm-hmm. So if you want to watch the video version, that's over on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel and also at rhymeswithasia.com. Uh, Joe, good couple games here. I mean, our, some of our favorite games, favorite soundtracks. And it's it's good to talk about our favorites. Uh, eventually, we'll be you know talking about more than just that. But it's it's all at the end of the day, they're they're good to great soundtracks and music that needs to be you know brought to people's attention. But also just credit given to the composers and the history behind the game. I agree, and just it's also funny that we both picked s- games that were cartoonish and right, also right, trying yeah. to do. There, there's a shared theme of doing something different from from others and stuff like that, and I think that worked out really well. That was not on purpose. It just sort of <laughs> ended up being how it was. Katamari was originally going to be my first game uh, before you brought up the idea of Kingdom Hearts two, and and it made a lot of sense. And Wind Waker, you had picked before I put down Katamari, if I remember correctly. Mm. Yep. So that that was not on purpose. It just sort of worked out that way, and I think it worked out really well. Absolutely, you know, it's a it's a good good set of choices. Looking forward to next week's games. Uh, follow us on Sound Chat OST on social media to get teases of what those will be. Before we go, uh, well, let's talk about the ending theme. How we'll play this out. When I think of Wind Waker covers, I think of a YouTube video that's now over ten years old. Believe it or not. Uh, from Freddy Getty on YouTube. That's with ease uh, on the end there. He did a cover called Wind Waker Unplugged, and it was his interpretation on the staff credits slash title theme with just instruments that he found laying around on a Christmas break, apparently. And it's it's a great composition. Wanted to leave you with that. On behalf of Joe DeVader, I'm Peter Spasia. We'll see you next time on Original Sound Chat. Take care.